the internet. It was the best of times and now possibly the worst of times, but best of times, oh, they were something. No, it's not Ghost Rider. No, it's not Hackers. Time to hang up that phone and get into some freaky links. In 1999, the Blair Witch Project came out of nowhere and brought horror into a new realm. Welcome to the internet, when there's still some sort of whimsy and anonymity. A time when a small group of college students could go and make an amateur documentary and make people feel like they had actually disappeared. What a wonderful time it was. The movie was an instant sensation, so what do you do when you got a hot property on your hands? You get to work on something in a similar vein and squeeze the juice out of it. Actually, in this case, the juice wasn't completely squeezed. Sadly, there was still a little bit left at the bottom of the box. Oh, and welcome to another episode of Freaky Links was the brainchild of Hexen Films, the same folks behind, yes, The Blair Witch. The series focused on Derek Barnes, played by Ethan Embry, who's running an underground website business dedicated to exploring the paranormal and urban legends. Derek, joined by his very own Scoobies, zoinks, 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 investigate claims that come in through the site, while at the same time attempting to find out what happened to his twin brother, Adam, the creator of FreakyLinks.com, or OccultResearch.com. Then, after 13 episodes in one season, it's gone. I don't think the world was ready for Freaky Links. If you think about it, they were ahead of the curve. The website debuted three months before the show actually aired. You were able to interact with the characters, even though at the time you had no idea they were characters on the soon-to-be show. There was a discussion board and I think even a chat room, if I can recall. After each episode, new info would be uploaded that viewers could interact with and investigate further into. Derek was vlogging and blogging before it was cool. I don't remember online journaling being a thing until a few years later, actually. They were also filming their paranormal hunts and uploading them to the site. There are a billion different of these shows now, but Derek was out there with the handheld camera before Grant and Jason. The folks from Blair Witch knew how to pull out all the stops. Also, the cast is great together. They all vibe off each other so well that it's hard to believe that they haven't always been friends previous to this. Embry is vastly underrated in most of the projects he's in, and I will say that just seeing his name when the credits come brings me an overwhelming amount of happiness. Dennis Christopher, Kareem Prince, Lizette Carrion, and the late Lisa Sheridan all deserve their own nods here as well. The intro music by Dust Bowl always gets stuck in my head as well, even though it should have been Power Man 5000's Nobody's Real. Nobody's real but let you know. I get why they changed it. A bigger act meant more royalties, but also the Dust Bowl track has that hack the planet cyberspace feel. I'll leave that one up for discussion. Now on to our favorite episodes, even though every episode should count. Subject Fearsome, episode one. This episode is a fantastic start for the series. Derek is recording, or podcasting, the events of his day, and then we're taken straight to how it all went down at the strip club with a huge neon sign of this naked lady with fire coming out of her nipples. We can say nipples, right? And Gimme All Your Lovin' by ZZ Top strategically streaming underneath. Now, let me tell you, I have watched the unaired pilot and it was a lot more bitchin' than what actually aired. Power Man 5000 theme and all. The music here was a major grab for sure. In addition to Power Man, there's Gravity Kills, Luscious Jackson, Soundgarden, and Massive Attack. They also had David S. Goyer at this point, and while he can be hit or miss, I feel like this genre is definitely his strength. I think it's hard to top this episode as it feels somewhat tonally different from everything else, but I've dipped my toe into that with this sentence before, so we'll continue a little later. If you haven't seen this, just go now and tell me that there isn't potential there. And definitely make sure you're watching the unaired pilot. The Stone Room, Episode 9. Why are all these old pasty dudes haunting Jason's family's law firm? Don't tell Jason's dad, he obviously won't believe it. Jason and Derek take a field trip to Philly so Jason can fill in at the law office while his dad is in the hospital. Meanwhile, one of the interns, Tori, played by Constant Zimmer, who's looking a lot like Saffron from Republica, shows off her belly tattoo and gets the bejesus scared out of her after seeing the ghost of a James Monroe lookalike. It takes till nearly the end of the episode to find out why the ghost ringleader is terrorizing members of the firm. I like that we got a little background on Jason, as he and Chloe are sort of the outliers of the group. Derek and Lon, great little techie name, makes perfect sense, but I guess you gotta have a couple of straight-laced normies in your paranormal squad. Sunrise at Sunset Streams, episode 12. Derek is the most Derek in this episode, and this is why I love it. He's giddy about a skunk ape, he has an active seniors fan club, takes on a wannabe shooter McGavin, and befriends Miss Voorhees herself, Betsy Palmer. Derek is tasked with going to the seniors community to investigate, or deny a possible skunk ape sighting. This episode is also Chloe-centric as things have finally come to a head regarding losing her therapy license due to helping Derek with one of the investigations. Oddly, the skunk ape incident will save everything. Who is the skunk ape? A dirty old man who likes to drink swamp water and steal panties. 
Well, now I feel like I'm in an episode of Beyond Belief. This one is goofy and fun with my favorite scenes being when Derek tastes some of the magical sewer water and the scene in the shower when they subdue the skunk ape with Chloe yelling, Bring it, you smelly bastard! You guys are gonna love this one. Live fast, die young, episode 10. Did I choose this episode because Jeffrey Combs plays a character similar to Herbert West? Maybe. Or is it a bleach blonde Eric Balfour? Possibly. Derek receives a video that shows a guy named Chapin, played by Balfour, jumping off a bridge and falling to what looks like his death until the guy actually gets up. Of course, Derek has to find out the how and even tries to get close to Chapin. My guy is dedicated. He winds up in a car crash, handcuffed to a wheelchair, and shot. How is this all possible? Joy juice. The secretion of fear from humans, which Chapin is slowly draining Derek's friends of. Combs is the medical examiner and, as I said, plays a less intense version of Wes. All of this played out over a soundtrack with the likes of Soulfly and Fear Factory. Oh, and throw in an appearance from Rhonda from Tremors, aka Ben Carter, and Big from Reservation Dogs, aka Zon McLaren, it's a full house. There's also a small, can't hardly wait reunion with Embry, Balfour, and Paige Moss, who plays Claudia. This is one where you should have predicted the ending, but winds up leaving you slightly depressed. The Harbingers, Episode 6. Suddenly Angus Grimm. I mean, that's the best kind of surprise, right? I think it's one of the best things about the series is who pops up in the episodes. The Tall Man is not one I would have expected myself. While most of the episodes tend to be Monster of the Week, don't worry, they're still a globulous entity. Sometimes we get clues on what was going on with Derek's twin, Adam. The episode is centered on that. Adam comes to Derek in a dream with a book called The Harbingers written by Wilson Ashcroft, played by Scrim. The author happened to once reside in the very place they have planned a trip to. I love the run-in with Derek's competitor, Stu Carmichael, webmaster of creepyclicks.com. You'll instantly recognize Stu as he's played by Daniel Roebuck, who is probably in every movie or TV show you've ever seen. Also, I'm not sure if you've noticed up to this point, but Derek seems to be a bit of a chick magnet. Since episode one, he's been eyeballed by most of the ladies that crossed his path. He's using those Nick Papa Giorgio skills. After each of the episodes, even though they were aired out of order, each of the songs were highlighted so you know which bands to check out. I always love that. So where can we watch it? Ugh. I feel like the series is sort of fading from existence. Right now, the only place you can find it is on YouTube. At one point, the series reran on the Chiller channel, which is when I caught it again and actually got to digest some of the episodes. Sadly, the quality of the series on YouTube is not the best. It seems like actual VHS rips. I'm just happy it's somewhere for the time being. The series was never released on DVD, but there were some bootleg box sets being sold at one time. Well, what happened? And obviously we know it's there's nothing of it now. It was ahead of its time and it wasn't marketed as it should have been. I'm slightly bitter. When the show came out, it had a good bit of buzz. They had the website which served to build it up in a fantastic way, but in the end, it wasn't enough. The ratings did not get as high as the network wanted, so down it went. There was also some talk that the scene with Adam in the tub was too much for Fox the Axe Warrior. After that, the studio continued to insert themselves into the series with much back and forth between the creators. Axon wanted it to be more frightening and Foxwell wanted more comedy and less scares. Embry himself even said that the original showrunner got axed at the beginning and the tone was changed and they were trying to find the tone of the show while they were filming it. Critics shot it down or remained cautiously optimistic, but who gives a shit what they think, right? I can't help but think that Freaky Leaks could find a more permanent home a few years down the line. Hell, even now, though I'm not entirely sure that modern Freaky Leaks works. I'm willing to entertain it if Ethan is. Not that I make the decisions around here, but I am free to float them. Sure, everyone jumping off the boat due to creative differences didn't help the show much, but it was still entertaining for what it was. Look, part of my reason for taking on this column had much to do with shining a spotlight on shows like this one. I wouldn't say that this one is entirely gone or forgotten, but there's just not enough out there. I hate the idea that it'll just fall through the cracks, never getting the credit it deserves. Not only that, but Freaky Links is a perfect snapshot of the early 2000s. It reminds us of what could have been and maybe what could still be. I hope that somewhere Derek is out there still researching the darkest corners of the internet.